Welcome to Connection Church. Uh, today we're going to be going through um, our next sermon in the series Holy Rest. And so I'm really excited that you guys are here. I'm excited you guys are online. Uh, the first week we talked about slowing down. And then last week, a good friend of mine, Danny Torres from Swerve Church, came and he spoke about eliminating distractions. And so both of those sermons were really they were kind of like the setup for the space that we need to be able to move in in order to experience holy rest. And so we've talked about before, holy rest isn't something, you know, we're just, we're driving down the road, you know, we're paying the bills, we're taking care of the kids, uh, we're doing the, you know, chores at the house, uh, we're working, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, snap, I accidentally started resting. Um, that's just not something that exists in our culture. Rest doesn't happen accidentally. Rest has to be intentional. And so we kind of identified, you know, there are probably several factors, but we identified being able to slow down and being able to eliminate distraction as two really important things that we need to be able to do to move into a space of holy rest. And so today we're going to be talking about as we've moved into this space and now we're ready to rest in a holy way, how exactly does that happen? The inspiration kind of for this series for me through the month of August was it was a handful of things. You know, August is typically a month of rest for our church. Uh, Daniel, our lead pastor, is on sabbatical. And I just got to thinking, we talk about Sabbath a lot. And even before Daniel uh, went on his sabbatical, he talked about Sabbath. And then Larry came in and guest spoke, and he talked about Sabbath. And I think they gave some really practical points. But I think a lot of times as the church, we talk about Sabbath and what it means and that we should do it, but we don't necessarily lay out practical steps and how that happens, especially culturally for us. And so I really just felt like if we're going to talk about Sabbath, let's talk about exactly how God intends for us to Sabbath. Let's talk about the practical steps to get there. So we've had slow down, we've had eliminating distraction, and today we're going to talk about consuming God's word. Consuming God's word. So we've moved to this space where uh, we've removed distraction, we've, we've slowed down, and, and really we plan to put these in kind of a sequential order. You can't really start consuming God's word in a way that, that gives you holy rest if you're going 90 miles an hour and you have all these distractions around you. So really, if you wanted to think about these sermons being linked together, it's really more like step one, slow down. Make sure you're looking for the things that God is trying to show you. Step two, Eliminate the distractions. And Danny talked about one of the biggest distractions that we have last week, and that is our phone, right? He talked about just having this technology, and it's not even like there's a lot of fun things you do on your phone, but you also need it. You know, there's, there's like business that happens on your phone, but we just get into that we are constantly available. And so it's really difficult for us to get into a space of holy rest if we're not slowing down and we're not eliminating distractions intentionally because of cell phones, because of technology, it will probably never happen on accident. And so let's talk about consuming God's word. That's what we're about to do. We're going to dive into God's word. We're going to see what the Bible even says about itself and why it's important. And before we do that, I would love for us to go and just enter into a time of prayer, just eliminating distractions, slowing down. Maybe right now in your head, there's, oh, this is, this is awesome being at church, but I, like, as soon as church is over, I've got to go do this. I've got to do my laundry. I've got to get home. I've got to pick up the apartment. I've got to get ready for tomorrow because tomorrow starts the work week. There's all those things that want to invade this space, but I just want to take a moment to pray together, invite God in, eliminate the distractions so we can slow down and rest in a holy way. If you would, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for giving us time. Lord, thank you for modeling what it looks like to rest. Lord, you did not need to rest on the seventh day after creation, but you did that so that you could show us how important it is. God, you didn't have to, to give us the Sabbath. It doesn't benefit you. It benefits us. Lord, thank you for being a God that not only created us and not only paid the ultimate price for us, but being a God that cares so much about us that you give us rest. And Lord, forgive us for pushing past rest so often. Lord, forgive us for not taking rest seriously. And Lord, please allow this to be a time that we come together and we learn how to rest in a holy way. Lord, we give this time to you. We just ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So there's, um, there's a lot of scripture, if you guys don't know, about scripture. There's a lot in God's word about God's word. 
So there were several ways we could take the direction of this sermon. And when I was thinking of, of kind of an anchor verse for what we'll talk about, there were several that, that popped up into mind, and some of them we will go through later in the sermon. But I thought, when we, when we think about resting in a holy way, we're, we're doing it with the intention of hearing God speak to us and hearing God prepare us for ministry and for a life that he has laid out for us. And so in those moments of rest, I really want comfort. We talked, I usually reference a 21 Pilot song at some point uh, in my sermon, but we talked about one of their songs and in that, in that song saying, sometimes quiet is violent. So a lot of times it's not even that we don't know that we're supposed to slow down or we don't know how to slow down. It may not even be that we don't know how to eliminate distractions or that we're supposed to eliminate distractions. When we do that without God, it's scary. When we come to a place where we're not moving and we're not accomplishing anything and we're not pushing forward in our culture, that is the most frightening thing that you can do if you're going to do that outside of the presence of the Lord. And so I thought, I want comfort in, in a time where I'm consuming God's word. So what is scripture about God's word that's comforting? And so there are several, but I, I kind of landed on this. If you would, uh, you can turn to if you have a physical Bible, or you can scroll to if you have a digital one. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. This is actually a really popular uh, Bible verse. I'm sure a lot of you have this memorized or at least have heard it before. But I'd like to go ahead and break it down just a little bit as we move into today's sermon. So in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, God's word says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So all these distractions around us, they will go away, but God's word lasts forever. I'd like to even move it back a verse before that, because Isaiah 48 is the one that people quote all the time. Hey, all this stuff is going to fade, but, but God and his word last forever. And we always talk about the grass and the flowers. And in a literal sense, it does mean the grass and the flowers, the things of this world. But in verse 7, it says, The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. So not just in the literal sense of grass and flowers, but in the metaphorical sense of like, we are like the grass. We are temporary. Our problems are temporary. The distractions, the things that we hold so high in our life, if I could just get this job, if I could just make this amount of money, if I could just have this apartment, or if I could just have this car, or if I could just have this social status or this many followers, all these things that we're so concerned about, they're all going to fade. People's opinions of us are going to fade. But what is going to stand? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And so we see that we receive comfort from God's word. He brings comfort through truth and longevity. God's word brings us comfort in these moments through truth and longevity. So I got to thinking about how we consume this truth and longevity. And it really got me thinking like God is the original content creator, right? All of the content that's being created now, as creative as it is, as amazing as it is, as incredible as some of the things you'll see on TikTok or YouTube or Reels or whatever, you see these things, you're like, man, these people are so creative. I wish I could be that creative. And God is like a million, a million, a million times more creative than these people. Could you imagine like back in the day and God just like creating every nuance of the earth and he just like TikToked it, and people are like, whoa, I, wouldn't, I never would have thought to, to make a tree, you know, provide shade for animals, and then this animal to live in a tree, and then the tree needs the animal, and then the, the animal needs the tree, and all these things fit together so creatively, so beautifully, so perfectly. God is the original content creator. There's nothing new under the sun. God created all of it. Now, as, as humans, we have creativity. He's so creative, he created us with the ability to be creative. That's insane to me, you know? So if God's the original content creator, and this is his word, this is content that we will consume. And to be honest, as a culture, we are experts at consuming content. I could not imagine, when I was eight years old, 
scrolling through Saturday morning cartoons and there were four different cartoons to choose from and they just stacked on top of each other on one channel and you just chose whether you wanted to watch all of them back to back to back or you wanted to go outside and play and come in for one. You know, there, there was no, hey, let's just record it. I mean, YouTube TV, you can record an unlimited amount of content. Literally, you can just add to library, add to library, add to, you could just do that all day, every day, and you would never run out of space because YouTube TV lets you add whatever you want to the library. And then you have Netflix, HBO Max, you've got Hulu, which I don't really watch a lot of. I don't know if somebody is in here is like mainly Hulu and like, shame on you, but we're really like HBO Max, YouTube TV. That's kind of like our two go to and Disney Plus, of course, you know, with the kids and Marvel. Um, but you guys, the way we consume that content is all about the end. That's why, that's why we're a culture that binge watches things. We, we would rather wait for the whole thing to come out so that we can race to the end and see what the ending is going to be. And now the people who are creating the content, they're not stupid. They realize, oh, okay, everybody cares about how this is going to be wrapped up. We are a culture that wants a good resolution. And what's so sad is we don't even know what a good resolution is. It's just dependent upon you know, whatever we're watching or whatever the situation is. Well, in this case, a good resolution might be the person lives. In this case, a good resolution is that they die. Or this case, they should get what they want or they don't get what they want. And it just kind of changes. We don't have like this moral centered truth because it's not based in truth. It's based in feeling. And so these content creators are saying, let's just string people along. That's why you have these, these series that'll go so long. And really the only thing people are waiting on is, are Ross and Rachel going to end up together? The only thing people are waiting on is who is, who is the mother of Ted's children, right? The only thing people are waiting on is what, what is going to happen at the end. And what's so sad about the content is it even has the power to like make or break the show. If you're strung along for five seasons, but it has a good ending, we'll run and tell everybody, this show is incredible. You have to watch it. Yeah, I mean, there was a writer's strike for like three years and they hardly knew what direction they were going, but man, did they wrap it up well. Or the ending might ruin the entire journey. Game of Thrones, anyone. Um, I, that, like you, you go you know, so long, you're like, this is probably the best show that's ever been put on television. And one episode, the ending, it just ruins it all. And so what's different about the way we consume scripture? And really, in my eyes, I see one really main difference, and that's consuming God's word isn't about the end. It's about the journey. Consuming God's word is about the journey. That's the first point. So when we look at it as a culture, and we, we tend to just try to consume everything we can as quickly as we can, we really, really hang on the ending. But in Scripture, we already know the ending. Right? We know that, that God created us. We know that, that we have fallen out of grace from God because we're imperfect. We know that he sent his son to die, and his son was perfect. He died, he defeated death, he came back to life, and he offers us this gift of eternal life. And we know that one day, God is going to come back to earth and reconcile or restore everything to its perfect intention, the way that he intended for it to be. So we already know the ending. So from a cultural perspective, we should just chalk it up. We don't even have to be in this content anymore because we know how it ends, we can just tell everybody what an incredible story it is and what a great ending it is, and then we don't even need to be in Scripture anymore because we've already binged Scripture. We got the TLDR. We got the recap. We're good. Only Scripture is not about the ending. Scripture is about the journey, and specifically it's about our journey. So the value and sustenance of God's Word lies in the journey. We already know the ending. And when we consume God's word with the same approach that we use to consume other content, we're really missing the point completely. When we consume God's word just to get through it, when we consume God's word just to get to the end, when we consume God's word and not really focus on the in-between parts, the parts where he wants to speak to us, we miss it. And here's the reason why. God is not concerned with whether or not our journey will affect the outcome. He's not concerned about that. 
when we watch shows, we typically kind of read ourselves into the characters, usually like the main character or the antagonist. If you're feeling like a little devilish, you're like, no, no, that's me. I'm the, I'm the bad guy in this one, you know. Um, but those characters always affect the outcome. Their stories affect the outcome. What's crazy about scripture is our individual story is not going to affect the greater outcome of what happens in scripture. The ending is still the same, but God still allows our story and our journey to play a role in the story of scripture. That's mind blowing to me. I still can't even like, when I was studying this, I thought that and I was like, I still can't even wrap my head around my journey can play a role that's important in the story yet not affect the outcome. There is no other content like that. So it's rather strange. But here's the deal. God is not concerned with whether or not our journey will affect the outcome. God is most concerned on whether or not we're going to allow the outcome to affect our journey. So God works backwards in that way. He's not worried about building up our story so that he can achieve this thing. He's like, look, it's been achieved. It's done. The outcome is decided. Now it's up for you to be in my word and see, are you going to allow this outcome to affect your personal journey? Are you going to see truth? And are you going to go to scripture focusing on the journey and allow my word to speak into your life so that you can be changed and so that your journey will look like the roadmap that I've given you in my word. And so we bring this back to rest. That's comforting. It's comforting to know that the ending has been decided for us. We don't have to go out and earn anything because one, we never could anyway. And two, God said, you are not for that. Your journey is not for the ending. I took care of that. Your journey is for you. Your journey is for you to learn more about what it looks like to live for me. So in that sense, a lot of the pressure for the outcome is it's kind of out of our hands. It's, it's off the table. That's, that's comforting. And so when we talk about rest, we talk about slowing down and eliminating distractions. If we were just doing normal rest, we could stop there. If you learn how to slow down and eliminate distractions, amen. Amen. Right. She's feeling it. If you learn to slow down and eliminate distractions, you, you're resting. But what does it mean to rest in a holy way? It means we have even more intention than just the rest. We have the intent to rest and we have the intent to prep for what that rest is going to lead to. And the way we can start that with that is consuming God's word. If you would, uh, we can turn to Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. Just want to look at a few more pieces of scripture before we move on to the next point. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, it says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, and it shall not return empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. So if we enter into rest with the intention of consuming God's word so that we can rest in a holy way, and we focus on it being about the journey, God says that, the words that come from his mouth that are recorded in scripture will not return empty and it will accomplish what he purposes. So we can be comforted in the fact that when we go to God's word within rest, that God's word will accomplish that comforting nature of what our journey should look like. I don't think there's anything more comforting than clarity. And the opposite of clarity is just the unknown. And I've been in that several times in my life, and it's just so uncomfortable when you don't know what job you might be working, or you don't know what school your kids might be going to, you don't know what neighborhood you're going to live in, you don't know if you can continue living in the neighborhood you live in, and you might have to move to a different neighborhood. There's just so many unknowns in life. But God offers us the opposite of that. He offers us the certain. And so our journey should be based upon this ending and knowing and being certain that God has accomplished the ending for us and that he wants to lay out our journey for us. In Luke chapter 1, verse 37. I may have written that reference down incorrectly because I'm not seeing it on here, but what I meant to reference is in Luke, 
um, there is scripture that says no word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. And so God is telling us here that his word doesn't return void and that his word doesn't fail. And so if we run to that in our holy rest, we will be comforted by consuming God's word. The second point is that consuming God's word is invigorating. Consuming God's word is invigorating. And when I thought of that word, I thought, oh, that's, that's a cool word. But what are some synonyms? What are, what are some things that, that kind of describe exactly what we're talking about when we say invigorating? And some synonyms are exhilarating, fascinating, lively, refreshing, energizing, and interesting. And so when we go to rest, with the intention of resting in a holy way, we want all these things to happen because we want to be able to take the rest that we've been given and we want to go and share that holy rest with others. We want to share that comfort with others. And so when we go to God's word and we consume it with the journey in mind, we can be exhilarated, we can be fascinated, we can be livened, we can be refreshed, we can be energized. We can rest in knowing that God's word gives us direction. In Psalm 119 verses or verse 105, it's another very popular scripture. And that's the one where it talks about God's word being a lamp into our feet. It's a light to our path. So we know that God's word gives us direction. We know that it gives us comfort. We know that it offers us the certain. When we focus on the journey that God has laid before us, we can rest in the knowledge that God's word will, ref will refresh and equip us. If you would like to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 16, it says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And in verse 17, it says that the man of God may be competent, equipped, for every good work. What's more comforting than feeling competent and equipped? You can move into a situation, you say, you know what, I've, I've taken time to consume God's word. I've taken time to slow down. I've taken time to eliminate distraction. I've gone to God's word and I feel competent and equipped to do the things that God is calling me to do. Also in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, We see God's word. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Again, God's word is about the journey. It's active. It's lively. It's walking with us. It discerns our heart. So we move into holy rest, and we... Focus on consuming God's word with the intention of hyper-focusing on the journey rather than the end. We see God move in incredible ways. We see him comfort us in incredible ways. We see him equip us in incredible ways. The last point for today. Consuming God's word leads to sharing God's word. Consuming God's word leads to sharing God's word. And I had a minor point in here too, and consuming God's word is never unhealthy. So we talk about consuming other content and you know, like your phone will pop up and be like, hey, your screen time's down. Like mine will say, your screen time is down 4%. And I'm like, oh, sick. I was on my phone way less than last week. It was like for an average of seven hours and 28 minutes a day. And I was like, oh, that hurts. <laughs> Um, and then you go through and it's like two hours on Instagram, one hour on Facebook, you know, and then you scroll all the way down and it's like 12 minutes on YouVersion Bible. Oh, that hurts. Um, so it is, it's, it's something that's never unhealthy for us to consume. We don't need to set, to set Bible time limits like we have to set screen time limits. We don't have to come in and say, okay, kids, it's been an hour. You need to jump off the TV, you know. Um, God's word is always healthy for us. And consuming God's word leads to sharing God's word. 
So we look in Luke chapter 2, verse 43 through 50. We're going back to Luke. I think this is the right scripture. But we'll see. I may have to recap again. So this is uh, the section of scripture that's talking about Jesus being in the temple. He was with his parents and kind of all of a sudden they were like, it had been like a day. And they're like, oh, I thought Jesus was like with our group, but I don't, I don't see him. I'm going to go ask some of the relatives. I thought, how cool. Like, I wish our culture was like that now where I was just kind of like, oh, they're probably, you know, kids are probably just hanging out somewhere with their family. You know, right now I'm like, I have to know where they are every second. Like, how cool would it be if it just like, Ah, Jesus is probably with us somewhere. He'll show up at some point, you know. Um, Unfortunately, that's not how it is now. But in verse 43, it starts, When the feast was ended and they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And so Jesus after this feast, is supposed to get up and leave, but he's just so ready to consume more and more of God's word and more and more of God's truth. He was just like, nah, you guys go. I'm I'm, I'm chill here. And then his parents were like, hey, we've been looking for you everywhere. Why why have you done this to us? Why have you you afflicted us in this way that, that you just disappeared? And he said, didn't you know? What else would I be doing? God's word is so comforting. It's ready to equip me for what I need to do. God's word lasts forever. Didn't you know I would be in the temple so that I can consume my father's word? And they were just kind of like, what? See, Jesus gets it. He's our example. Jesus is showing us how important it is to spend time consuming God's word and God's truth. Consuming God's word is about the journey. It's invigorating, energizing, exhilarating, fascinating, refreshing, and interesting. And consuming God's word leads to sharing God's word because you can't share what you don't consume. You guys ever eaten at like an amazing restaurant? And the first thing you want to do is like, oh, you gotta go, you gotta go check out this new pizza place. You gotta go check out this new Italian place. It's, Phenomenal. It's almost like you want to be the first person to tell your friend group about it. Look at this thing I discovered. But if you didn't consume that to begin with, then you wouldn't be there to share it. And so when we have these amazing experiences consuming God's word and we experience this holy rest the way that it's supposed to be experienced, we will be led and have a desire to share that experience with others. Application. So what are we going to do with this, right? This is all these practical steps about how to enter into holy rest. So how are we going to put this into practice? So this week, I want you to make it a point to consume God's word, focusing on the journey that he has planned for you. Focusing on the journey, not the ending. Focus on the journey he has planned specifically, specifically for you in light of the glorious resolution we have already found in Christ Jesus. We already have an amazing, incredible, wonderful, astounding resolution. And that is Christ gave his life for us. So we don't have to worry about the ending. We need to worry about the journey. And I pray that you find rest in reading and listening and consuming the voice of God. Let's pray. God, we're just so grateful for your voice. We're thankful for the inspiration that you gave so many different authors to record your voice, your word, in scripture. God, we thank you for that tool. We thank you for the ways that you use it 
to allow us to enter into holy rest, God, to be invigorated, God, to equip us. Lord, we're so grateful for the ways that you work in our life. God, I pray that we would not take consuming scripture for granted. Lord, I pray that we would cherish the ability to consume scripture. And God, we would do it not in a way to binge it, not like we're watching TikTok, God, not focusing on the end, but Lord, focusing on the journey that you have set before us. God, the plans that you have for us through your word. God, the end of scripture is amazing. It's incredible. We should reflect on it. We should spend time in prayer about it. We should spend time thanking you. But Lord, your scripture for us begins with the end. So Lord, may we start there with that truth and consistently consume scripture so that we can be equipped and prepped and encouraged for the journey that you have ahead of us. Lord, we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. We do this every week. This is just a way to remind us of uh, God's love for us and just how we should be praying uh, back to God. So if you would join me in the Lord's Prayer and then you'll be dismissed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.